Hello, it's Duncan. We've got some good news on Team Gilded Bros, and that is that we are hiring a new developer. I know, right? It could have been you, but you didn't apply. Maybe you didn't see the advert. Anyway, taking them through the code base, we realize that whilst most things are understandable, especially now we have divided things into these packages, the error handling really isn't. Now, Java has a long and, shall we say, bitter history of error handling. And if you read the book that I wrote with Nat Price, you'll find that we really rather like to check the exceptions, but they are a thing that hasn't made it into Kotlin. So looking at our code, we find that there is quite a bit of code that basically throws exceptions, IO exceptions, and so on, that isn't communicating that it could fail in that way. And there are other places that we just raise errors when we can't do a thing. For example, in item, we've got this require. And again, there are no real clues except by reading the source code that constructing an item could go wrong. So we're going to make a start today on that. I think it's going to be quite a long process. I think it might be a while before we can check in or at least push to production. But with luck, by the time we finish, we will be communicating a great deal better how this code can fail. Okay, well, we happen to be looking at items, so let's start there. The issue here is this require. If you were with us from the beginning, you remember we tried using an unsigned int here to represent the quality, but that didn't go so well. And the issue here is that we can call the constructor of item with a minus one or something, and this will throw at runtime, and there's no clue that that can happen. As it happens, though, all of our actual calls to constructor are via this item of. See, there are a lot of them, but almost all of them are in test code. In production code, we only have one place that we do that, and that's when we're parsing our stock list. What we'd like is that certainly production code was warned that this call could fail. And an easy way to do that in Kotlin is just to return a nullable type. So if we return item question mark here, that would be saying you can call this, but you might not be able to get an item back. Of course, that won't compile because all the places that currently call item of will now have to deal with that nullable. In this case, that's okay, because we could just say here, well, we'll pass the pane down the line. If we were to get a null there, then we would just pass the error on. Now, no, this isn't quite the same because we've lost the context of what was wrong. Here, we actually have a message and we've lost that message somehow. And here, just to, we cannot create item. I'm going to let that sit with us for a moment. It's a problem we will solve later on. But for now, we're just going to push a change through the code base and see how it goes, see how it feels. You can see that we fixed one compile problem, but not all the ones in the tests. So what I think we'll do is we'll call this item of two for now, and we will duplicate getting back our old item of. And this one will just return item. We've got two versions. And in our production code, for now at least, we will call item of two. And our test code will continue to be calling the other one. So what we expect here is that we have changed the behavior in a subtle way around the amount of information that's being passed up in exceptions. But apart from that, we haven't changed anything. OK, this item of we're now saying is a little bit dangerous. So what I think we'll do is we will move that into the test string. So only tests can call it. And in order to give ourselves a clue, we'll call that test item. That will cause a large swathe of changes but everything should still compile and pass. And let's just move this into our test tree. And maybe we'll put it in the root. Add that to git. Check it all builds. Which it does. And then we can take this test item and maybe just move that function from here into test data. Now then, 
Returning here, we can rename this one to item off. And just check that everything still builds and runs. It does, and this test item is now empty, so we can delete it. So let's just review what we've done. We have taken item of and said it now returns a nullable item. It may return null if it can't create an item. It never actually returns null because the only thing it can actually do is throw here. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix this to be try to create an item, catch any exceptions. And if we've got an exception, we'd return null. Now, somewhere we actually have a test that shows that we throw an exception if quality is negative. And I think we're going to try and find that. I guess it's in domain and item tests. Here we go. You see here, well, we're calling test item, but that's not what we call here. We want to call our item of in this one case. And we probably should have changed this test before we change the code. I think that this will now fail because we're not throwing a legal argument exception. There we go. Whereas actually what happens now is that this is null. Returning to test data, it would be better here if we were to be calling the item of. So let's do that. So we can say this is item of, given our name and some by date and so on. So we'll call the production code. And then if that is null, then in a test we just have an error. Okay then. So we now have our item of factory function and callers are warned that that can fail because it returns an item question mark, a nullable item. But nothing is actually stopping anyone calling this. We just don't happen to be doing that. What we'd like to be able to do is make this a private constructor. Let's try that. And here we have a problem that this item of cannot call the constructor now because it's in a different class. If we had a module system, we might make the constructor internal. That might solve our problem. But I think what we we'll do is we are going to create a companion object here, which will be a place that can see that private constructor. There's no good refactoring for this. So I'm just going to pick this up, move it into here and go and fix things up. So now item of can see the private constructor because it's in the companion object. But we need to move the calls to talk to the companion object. So let's delete that and find what problem that causes. And this would be item.companion. Dot item of. Of course, we can actually then just get rid of that. That's one. And we expect the same problem in our test data. So this is item, item of. And one last one. And that's all working nicely. One more thing we can do, we could actually rename this. If we rename this to invoke and make it an operator. Now, if we find the places we were calling that, so we've got two item here. Now we can remove the invoke. And we have something that looks like a constructor, but can return a null. 
And that's quite a nice selenium, I think. Same thing here. And here. Okay. Now, as I said, I'm not happy checking this into production because we're losing information if things do go wrong. But I think I will check this in. We'll just have a look at sort of changes that happened. Well, what happened is that we changed this name here to test item. Well, that's all good. Item itself, we know the changes we've made there. And in persisting, we've just changed. We've lost this item of and started calling our sort of fake constructor. Okay, so this is now use item dot invoke returning nullable item. Bound to be some issues with that. One warning. Okay. So this is saying that we may have made a private constructor, but you could still call copy passing anything you like into it. And that is effectively calling the constructor. However, we have got this test here, this require, which makes sure that we can't break things that way. And we have this with quality method that does some coercion and does the right thing. We're still left with the question of whether item should be a data class, but I think on the whole, it's good for us. So I'm going to say, let's not worry about that. Suppress it for here. And we'll say, the reason this is safe is that it is protected by in, I'll see that, in, in it. Let's commit that. Good. Now let's have a look at our production code and see what we can do in light of that change. So let's have a look in persisting. And here you see that we are throwing an error straight away. Well, let's not do that. Let's just push up a little bit. Let's say if we allowed string to item to return a nullable item, then what would happen? That would cause another error in here. And that's because this is now creating a list of nullable items rather than a list of items. And Stockness knows that it can't have nulls in its items. So I think let's uh, push our nullability up a bit, shall we? Let's put this to here. Don't think this uh, to list was ever required. And let's say, well, we can do all that work. And then we can say, if there were any nulls, then we have a problem. So then we can say, if items.any then we could have our error. That would be the same behavior. Now, it always makes me a little bit nervous, this sort of thing, because because we had exceptions before, we don't really have any tests for this. That's something we might like to fix at some point, and I think we will. But for now, we're just demonstrating this pushing out of our type. Unfortunately, Checking whether there aren't any nulls doesn't help here, but we can say filter not null. Do we want the error to happen here? Well, actually, we could just carry on. We could return a stock list question mark from here. Let's see what happens. So this would be return null. And we could make that a little bit nicer by pulling the return out of here. Now we have a problem in file load items. Well, we can fix that by making that nullable. Let's see how that goes. Okay. So now we have our load items here and that could be null. And I suppose if it is, well, we can just 
pass that error up. Now a compiler knows that if it got through here, then loaded is not null. That's all good. Little issue in our fixture. We can fix it in the same way. And in our test, we don't mind there being errors at runtime. And this is not, could not create item. We don't know what the issue is now, really. We're just going to null. This is could not load stock. You see now everything compiles and passes its tests. Okay, back a bit. Do we want the error here? Well, we could just pass it up, couldn't we? In this case, we return rather than throwing. Now we have an issue that this list handler expects something that doesn't return null. Let's have a look. But we can fix that there. If we do, well, we're back to our issue here. We call listing, it might return. So let's say error. Now this is the entry point for our request. And if we wanted to at this point, we could just return a different response rather than throwing, raising an error here. I don't think we'll do that yet because at the moment we're relying on catching exceptions to report errors. And if we were to just return an internal server error here, we wouldn't be logging them in any way. So we'll hold off that for now and just review what we've done. And what that is, is that we have pushed down nullability all the way from our point where we discover we have a problem, which is this point here where we fail to create an item. And we just said, well, every time something goes wrong, we'll return a null. As I say, that loses information about what went wrong, but if there is only one real thing that can go wrong, then it's a very good solution in Kotlin. Not good enough for us, probably. So next episode, we will look at introducing an error type to carry information about what went wrong up through our code. In the meantime, though, I think we will just commit this. And as I say, I'm not comfortable pushing this to production because I think we'll lose information, but it has at least reminded us of the path through the code and we will be in a good position to add the errors in next time. If you'd like to see that episode, please subscribe to the channel. And if you have enjoyed this, you'll probably enjoy the book that I wrote with Nat Price called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook. Details of which are in the show notes below. Thank you very much for watching.